viewers, my name is Jennifer Nash and welcome to another exciting episode of Wired Women. Today I have an amazing guest on the show and her name is Emma and I'll let her introduce herself. Emma, welcome to the show. Please introduce yourself to our viewers. Who is Emma? Oh, wow. Thanks very much, Jennifer. And hi, Wired Women. I'm Emma, Emma Ewing. I'm the founder and one of the main trainers at Big Fish Training. And um, I'm part of a collective of uh, people training within the PR, marketing and communications industry. Amazing. And um, as I said to you before, my passion is to know the authentic story behind the big fish lady. So tell us in your own words, who is Emma as a human being? Oh, my goodness. Well, <laughs> to try to keep it succinct, um, in, in a professional sense, I am a former PR and I've used that knowledge to um, help other people. But on a personal level, I'm a mother. I'm um, a silly person, I would say. I'm somebody that likes fun. And, you know, I'm really lucky, I would say. I don't know if this describes me as a person, but maybe it is. I've got a habit for collecting knowledge and I've got a habit for meeting interesting people. And I've been so lucky to have a, a profession now where I just meet really fabulously intelligent, curious people who are interested themselves. And we get to, you know, we get to share knowledge. It's great. Yeah, you just took the words out of my mouth. I think curious, being curious is a very fun fact about you. And I love that because, you know, you get to meet a lot of people. But before I get ahead of myself, Emma Ewing. Um, Ewing is a popular surname from the Dallas series. Is there any relation there? <laughs> I think we should get that out of the way. <laughs> I think we should get that out of the way. So I married a J Ewing. So, you know, but he was not a, a J.R. Ewing. He's a J.K. Ewing. We don't live in South Fork. There are no links. It's uh, it's a good it's a Scottish name. So that's where um, that name has come from. And I married into the clan. Unfortunately, there's no there's no great oil barons as far <laughs> as I know. <laughs> Lurking okay. there. I'm glad we've put that into um, <laughs> to bed. So yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you th so much for that. And um, so Emma, I do know that you are a fun person and you love fun. So um, would you say that that's one of your attributes when it comes to your professional setting? Is that one of the skills that you apply when you are training PR professionals? Because it must be a daunting uh, role to actually be training trainers per se, because PR professionals professionals are um, known to be the people that actually coach clients to do certain things and or to present themselves in front of the media. So what sort of um, attributes in the fan context do you use to do that? Oh, that's such a good um, question. And maybe I go back a tiny, tiny bit just to talk about fun, because for a really long time, I used to be quite scared of this aspect of my personality. And particularly like in my 20s, I try to be really grown up. I mean, you know, really sort of I dress like a six year old and I'd be, um, you know, I still do that a little bit. And I really try to sort of look all grown up and serious. And then, you know, but actually I like making stupid jokes. I mean, before they were called dad jokes. I like to make dad jokes and I like silly puns and I like to laugh about the world. Mm -hmm. And I was really scared to kind of do that. But as I moved into training, I realised that in order to make it accessible to people, you've got to be funny. And I suppose I'm not a fan of forced fun. I think we both know what I mean by that. Yeah, sort of like, hey, everybody, it's going to be hilarious today. Um, and I, what I suppose where I come to is um, about, well, our values are fun, professional and collaborative. And mm -hmm. so, you know, so it's the, the idea is to meet professionals where they're at mm -hmm. and then if there's something we're collaborating on, that becomes fun. So we can, can be focused and fun together. We laugh. I try to use a particularly courses that might seem boring around maybe grammar and, um, you know, writing things like press releases. I deliberately use extreme examples and some of them will be a little bit crude maybe and so you know but there'll be funny examples and try to kind of put memes in and things that um, lighten the atmosphere. Mm. 
I agree with you because I think we actually share that attribute, you and I both, because it's not about forced fun that would be uh, almost to uh, an extent cheesy, but it, it's fun that just helps um, the um, situation or the relationship to be a bit lighter as opposed to being so heavy and so structured and so rigid. So I like that point. Um, and also, so to, uh, going forward to um, maybe looking back at your life, would, could you walk our viewers, talk our viewers through where you've been and how you've ended up being where you are now? And what was your aha moment? What was that moment in time in your life where you said, aha, uh -huh, that's big fish and this is what I'm going to do. And I would also like to know what is behind big fish because it's quite an interesting uh, brand. Oh, thank you. Okay, so a little bit to unpack there. I realised as you said it, that um, my aha moments, I can't believe I'm going to tell you this, um, have all kind of come from quite tearful moments. So maybe a point where I felt very low um, mm -hmm. in terms of what was happening in my career mm -hmm. and almost being hit on the head mm -hmm. by the world saying this isn't you know this is a moment for you to do something different so mm -hmm. um you know in the initial stages of of my career I um I very much wanted to change the world I still want to change the world and I do think comms will do that um and I was working um in Whitehall I had a policy job that's exactly what I I wanted um but unfortunately and I I've the greatest respect and I still work with you know officials across Whitehall it wasn't for me. Mm -hmm. And um, it's that question of be careful what you want for, because I think I'd worked for about 18 months to get into this, this position. Mm -hmm. um, I was just not the right fit for what was needed. And um, there were many tears over what I thought at the time was a, you know, an ir irreparable career mistake. And then as I moved through into doing things in press office, I realised, oh, there's a world out there, there's PR. Moved into PR, it was like, whoa, the lights came on. Mm. Um, and then the kind of the, the second moment was also a, a teary moment when, um, you know, I realised that, you know, at the role I had within my agency, I just got a young child, I just had a baby, and just the responsibilities and the time that was needed to put in just simply wasn't compatible. And I felt like I was failing. And that's when I set up Big Fish Training so I could do it more on my own terms rather than someone else's. Mm. That's a common thread with women, isn't it? And I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, it's really interesting, the disparities between women in, um, in jobs. I mean, I just saw statistics coming out recently again. I mean, I thought we were so over this, but um, C-suite positions or even women are on the top, uh, 100 Forbes list in America. There's a video going on in um, on Instagram right now. It's just uh, it's atrocious what the the numbers are saying and and just how women are not being accommodated. They're being um, atrocious. Uh, they're being um, attacked on how they dress. They're being attacked on their avail uh, availability. They're called uh, b words if they can't or if they're ambitious. They want to get to where they need to get and all sorts of things still happening. You would think after so many years since the suffragettes would have moved and advanced much uh, further in life. So to that point, um, disparities, uh, female uh, gender disparities are still very common, especially in the PR industry. So as a trainer, when you're training, I know that you train actual practitioners, but maybe interns and any other people in between. What sort of numbers are you looking at in terms of how many women are actually coming into um, the profession or are already in the profession in comparison to the male um, uh, students that you train? I would say it's, it's still very heavily dominated as a, as a female profession. Um, the latest kind of figures that I know of was a, a great survey done by GW um, PR, so um, Global Women in PR. And um, in 2017, they were looking at the gap um, about it, the, the majority, it's majority women in the PR industry, but um, there was a, a huge percentage of agencies that are owned or run um, by men. And, it, you know, it was an interesting kind of look. I actually think that um, 
you know, we, it's very disappointing when these other figures come out and you've just referenced something that I haven't seen. And it's just like, you know, it does make your heart sink. Um, but at the same time, you know, I am seeing, I suppose one of the reasons I love this industry so much is, is you know, I am seeing that people are much more switched on. People, you know, of, of all genders are much more switched on now about trying to make this an equal place, you know, and helping us to not see ambitious women as the B word. It's difficult, isn't it? Because we see videos like you've talked about um, and the figures coming out and it feels really disappointing. You know, we feel like this, the things could be more equal. And, and yet I am seeing, you know, one of the reasons I love this industry is I am seeing real examples of savvy people, women, men, everyone kind of, you know, making the, making the whole industry better for everyone. And, you know, that gives me hope. Yeah, that gives me hope that this systemic stuff, maybe legacy stuff that we hadn't addressed before, is now coming up into into the spotlight. That's interesting. Um, and this is one of the reasons why um, I have found that uh, create, that's why I created Wired Women, because I felt like there was still that big gap in the in the industry where, uh, yes, women are a lot of them in PR, but they're not enough in the C-suite level but also they're not enough agencies, like you said, to your points that are owned and uh, run by, uh, by women. So I felt like there was that gap where there's not enough visibility of women in PR, even though they outnumber their counterparts in, in terms of numbers. Um, so yeah, those gender disparities are still very evident in every industry for that matter, it's just not PR. So um, in terms of um, the outlook, what do you think and feel like 2021 holds for the industry, the PR industry as a whole, but maybe more specific in England? Um, I ask this question because I feel like um, the PR industry is really, really uh, booming right now uh, for whatever reason, and especially when there's a global uh, crisis going on in the world. Um, a lot of people do go to PR specialists to actually help them to articulate what is going on within their brands, but also maybe their own personal brands. Where do you see uh, the industry post-COVID 2021? Oh, wow. If only I had that crystal ball. I love the fact and I'm honoured that you asked me about that. I can maybe only speak to what I see now because actually what I, I'm seeing is a fracturing and it's quite an interesting one. Um, and it will be interesting to see how that plays out into 2021 as, as you know, things things continue to move through, you know, the pandemic and, and you know, whether we dare say post-pandemic. Um, because, you know, there, let me give you a couple of examples like you say, PR has become hugely important for um, brands and for individual people on their personal brand to ensure that they are attracting the customers, you know, the, the reputation that they need. And I think we've all seen through COVID how important communications is. I don't know about you, but every single person I know in this industry, um, those on in-house particularly, and then those in agencies supporting them, I just have just been working their socks off. You know, because there's so much communication. Suddenly, internal communications became this rising star. And, you know, and external communications, explaining the changes to the public became huge. And then we have um, the other side of it, which is people seeing PR, even marketing to an extent, as being an overhead. And then they have cut. So I, I personally know, you know, a number of agencies, perhaps in the in the travel lifestyle space, you know, whose clients have been cutting back because their business has been effective, affected and PR is a kind of easy cut. So I think we're getting a real fracturing. And I, I heard uh, two days ago, it's quite an interesting point that um, Elon Musk's company, you know, have decided to cut their entire PR department. So they are the first automotive company. I know, right? Mm -hmm. That was my reaction too. Yeah. Um, so Tesla now has absolutely no corporate communications PR, as far as I know, looking at industry papers um, at all, which is astonishing. And, you know, I read this from a reporter's point of view that they can't get answers now 
that it, it's Elon <laughs> and then nothing. There's this fixed wave. That's going to be so interesting. So mm -hmm. that's why I can't call it. Mm -hmm. People are cutting PR and people are building PR. Yeah. That's, that's a very good answer and a very measured one at that. Um, so thank you for that. But how I see it as well is that, you know, um, of course, the likes of um, Bill Gates, he did mention talking about these um, movers and shakers up there. Bill Gates did say, uh, made a sentence, a statement saying that even if he had to lose all of his millions in the world, the only thing that he wouldn't cut out is public relations. So you kind of see those variations in terms of uh, thought leadership um, sentiments um, when it comes to PR. But also in the same sense, uh, we you mentioned uh, reputation, reputation management, whichever uh, side of the coin you are on, on reputation, whether you are um, reacting to sentiments being um, spread across social media or whether you are just um, communicating internally with, with your stakeholders. It's really, really um, interesting to see that a lot of people overlook that, the importance of, of having that reputation managed at all times. Because instead of waiting until things go wrong and then you react to that, um, better you have a crisis plan in place and then you're ready. But also like maybe places like Twitter and I think Elon Musk as an example, he's probably taking to Twitter thinking it's better and clever for him to directly engage with, um, with his audience as opposed to um, uh, going through a PR agency. But I failed to understand that because then he's removing that protection screen that he might have and he'll end up saying things out of context and out of, he might even be out of touch with the audience and peer person is there to actually guide him and, and moderate that temperament, so to speak, of how he might um, respond maybe to criticism. So it's a it's a win win situation. And to your point, you put it right. It's really difficult. You can't have a crystal ball and say, "This is how we're going to see it unfolding in the next few years." But but it's good to to see some insight from your point of view how you look at it. So thank you, thank you for that. Um. So um. And Emma. So if we had to look back um, at the young, your younger self, the younger mm -hmm. Emma, say you were 18 years old, uh, what would you say to your younger self and to our viewers about the things, the lessons that you learned from that time frame in your life? <laughs> what a question. <laughs> That's wonderful. Uh, and, and as you say, it, I'm picturing the younger me and um, feeling a little bit sorry for her, actually, you know, just standing there on the precipice of adult life and, and you know, just knowing what's not that I've had a, a terrible life. I haven't at all. But, you know, there's just quite a difference between the 18 year old me and, and the me now. Um, I, what I would say is it will be all right. You mm -hmm. know, actually, whatever hits you, you know, when you're faced with bereavement, difficult things. You, you'll get through it because that you know that is my belief that you know human beings we we are resilient it can take us down and there's no shame in being taken down and in being vulnerable or, or asking for help but actually you know I would say it'll be all right let's see I wish the the 18 year old me I do wish had a little you know kind of creepy hologram me that, that appeared and said it'll be okay you know I think knowing it would be okay it, would, would have felt more I'd have felt more confident and the other thing I've talked about a lot very publicly um this year because I've seen it really affect people in our industry communications and PR is imposter syndrome and you know I definitely have had that following me around and I've you know I've I mostly think I've lost it and then it will go hello you know and just pop up remember in, in me <laughs> exactly like hey you old friend I'm like no um and I wish that perhaps to the 18 year old me, I'd say, um, yeah, you don't have to pretend to know everything and um, it, you don't have to know everything because I'm not even sure I wanted to pretend. I just thought I had to know everything. Mm. And, you know, that leads to perfectionism mm. and wanting to do, you know, and, and not wanting to kind of put things out. And I think I know that's held me back um, at key moments in my life. Yeah, that's amazing because the hindsight is always twenty twenty, isn't it? 
it's always clearer. <laughs> so yeah. thank you for sharing that. And and also, yeah, to just uh, add on to the imposter syndrome, a lot of um, guests that I've spoken to, they've, they've realized that even with them, uh, maybe themselves or maybe the clients that they serve, um, a lot of us suffer from that um, imposter syndrome um, to a certain extent because we feel inadequate to um, be in a place that we, we need to be. And I think more so for women as well. Because again, women, we feel like uh, it, I, I don't deserve it. I don't need to be here. I can't be doing this. I can't. And honestly, you know, a man would be better suited for this and stuff like that, making excuses. So I'm glad you brought that up again, because it's something that we really need to address in the industry as well as women. So uh, moving forward, um, if you had, to, we had to ask you, what sort of advice uh, would we be able to uh, nick out of your two? kit um, for our viewers. What is a set of advice sound bites that you would give to our viewers? Let's say they're just beginning to think about going into a business for themselves, and especially during these um, times of, of the pandemic. What sort of toolkit has helped you stay resilient to your to follow on to what you just said earlier on and, and has helped you to sustain your business to keep going? Oh, such a powerful question. How would I talk to other people about this? I would suggest that they are not afraid to ask for help and that they gather and find trusted sources. You know, we, we sort of call them mentors or whatever, but I just say they're nice friends that you can get on the phone with or on the Zoom and say, this is happening for me. Is it happening for you? And, and, and give and take. So clearly in the role I'm at, I do have lots of people that will ring me up and, and kind of ask for coaching, as it were, in a, in a kind of informal way. But, you know, I'll do the same. And just having a, a group of people around you who understand your professional landscape, what you're trying to achieve with your business and being able to use them as a sounding board. But then the other part of the toolkit is... And I don't know if you found this. I'd love to, to hear from you because I, you know, I suspect I think you might feel the same way is actually, though, take that advice and listen, but put it through the filter of you. And actually, it's what you know is right for you. And, you know, there is that quite funny phrase, isn't there? It's like you do you. I like that. I like that a lot. <laughs> I love it now. I used to be a little bit sceptical about it. I feel it seems a little bit cheesy and, you know, but actually the more I've known and particularly through the pandemic, actually, mm. I've realised that decisions I've made were the right ones. You know, mm. at the time I was hearing dissenting voices or, you know, but I made the best decision for me mm. and my business and my team at the time. Mm. And that has been borne out. So probably the toolkit is more the mindset and the ability to reach out, having good people around you, oh, such lovely people around me, I've, you know, through my life. And then, but, but understanding you and putting it through you. And, and so that's, if I may, is it okay to, to kind of ask you about that? Because I, you know, I'd love to hear your take on that. No, I completely agree because at the end of the day, um, it's not selfish to do you. It's, it's um, more, I think, of saying that, um, different situations, different scenarios will uh, turn out differently for different people. So if you do me, you know yourself better. There's no other person that knows you more than you know yourself. Um, so you are in a better position to articulate your situation than anybody else can tell. Yes, people, like you said, mentors, friends, you don't have to label them as, as uh, mentors. They can advise you but only you will know 100% where you're at, where you stand. So it's about internalizing your situation and understanding where you're at at that very moment. In fact, I have a video uh, on YouTube actually that talks about that because it's very well other people dressing things up for you, but until you actually acknowledge your own position and your own feelings about everything, you will never be true to yourself in fact hence you will never be authentic and if you're yeah. not authentic then you're just mimicking what other people are doing and you're doing it for wrong reasons really and, yeah. and if you're doing things for the wrong reasons you're not bound to succeed exactly so, so yeah I completely agree with you 
Yeah. And I wonder if that kind of leads to imposter syndrome more, because if you're trying to kind of, you know, if, if I was trying to be someone else, I was trying to emulate you, let's say, and, you know, I felt like I was failing. I think that would really add to my own feelings of imposter syndrome. It's like, why can't I do this as well as she does? Because it's mm-hmm. very easy to compare. Yeah, isn't it? It's very easy to look at other people and think, oh, they're fantastic. I wish I could be like that. And, and to just list your own inadequacies and not necessarily see who you are 100% and what you bring to the party. Yeah. And, and uh, as well, being able to just say, you know what, I can't be everything to uh, like everybody else. But like, again, to your point, I can be me. And that's enough. You know, don't worry about, you know, what you're not able to do. And and if you're doing it differently from somebody else, maybe that's your unique selling proposition. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, amazing. So thank you so much for that. Um, and I'm sure our viewers would love to... Um, to meet you and learn more about what you do. And actually, I don't know if we even managed to clarify why your business is called um, uh, (laughs) Big Fish. So maybe you could just uh, just mention a little bit on that and how they can actually get in touch with you if they were to come out looking for you for more information and learning more about what you do and you do so brilliantly. Oh, lovely. Well, thank you very much for saying that. I need to have you uh, every morning, a little kind of introduction by you to the day. That would really uh, set me up. Thank you. Um, so, yes, if, if people are interested in finding out more, we've got loads of resources on the website, actually. Um, lots of free webinars to support people through COVID. So there's information on remote working. Mm-hmm. It's at www.bigfishtraining.com. Mm-hmm. And you can also find me, Emma Ewing, <laughs> on LinkedIn. And I try to post interesting stuff there mostly it's not um I hope it's not self-indulgent stuff but just interesting (laughs) kind of tips and um and why did I call it big fish training well knowing that I wanted to um create a professional training company I'm very specific for our industry I remember that when I was buying services in agency uh, training services, I couldn't ever remember the names of the training companies because they were all like, I'm making these up, but you know, they're like PBL consulting and communication skills, limited PLC, you know, just, (laughs) it was all a little bit dry. And yet all around us, we've got these amazing agency names, you know, people just call themselves cool names and um, you know, the PR industry is not boring. So I wanted to have something memorable. And um, I, I remember just sitting in the garden chatting with friends and then we were kind of laughing and some kind of beat came on and we were just taking them the kind of, um, try not to swear on your thing there. We were teasing each other and kind of doing big fish, little fish cardboard box, you know, the, the kind of funny, <laughs> silly dance um, ages me a bit. And um, I was like, oh, but do you know what? I could call it big fish because that's a kind of funny thing big fish yeah. training but also it's about being a big fish in a small pond and PR is all about helping your clients kind of punch above their weight so that's where it came from no no um, amazing branding story just a silly brainstorming in in the garden inspired by music and I love music anyway so it's it's nice to have that in my brand I don't tell many people so now I've gone on record <laughs> But that's what makes it authentic, you know, the story behind how you came about with your brand. That's amazing. It makes it more authentic and more relatable as a human being. But also, um, in my understanding, when I first came across it for um, here's my two pennies, my two cents, I thought um, big fish. So this is from a consumer point of view. I thought big fish is um, teach to fish. Because um, in the Bible, which I'm a Christian and I'm not ashamed to say, um, they talk about um, it's better to give somebody uh, to teach someone to fish than to give them a, a fish because then they can be able to go back and then they've learned the skills and they can have food all the time than if you just go to the river and get fish and give it to them. So I thought big fish training. So I thought you're training people's skills so that they become. (laughs) I love that because that's exactly what, you know, training should be about. It's about equipping people. You know, people have always got the skills within them. 
Yeah. You know, it is just about encouraging people to unlock them, to see past them. You know, it, it's why the why it should be collaborative because you can you can teach someone to fish and then they're self sufficient and in fact then they're teaching other people and you watch people go and fly. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. the joy, isn't it? You watch people um, mixing <laughs> mixing my metaphors there, flying and fishing, <laughs> maybe fly fishing. Um, but you know, you watch people take off because then they they bring the skills that they've mm-hmm. got. They you know they manage, they drive their career, and it's it's uh, it's a joy to see. Yeah, thank you for that. That's lovely. I hadn't considered that before. You're very welcome. You can write me a check. <laughs> I certainly will. <laughs> Speaking of joy, it's been an absolute joy talking to you today, Emma. I've really enjoyed talking to you today and I wish we could go on. But unfortunately, we've run out of time today. That's all we had time for. And I would love an opportunity to talk to you again in the future on my thought leadership um, uh, think tank. That way we can maybe expound a little bit further in terms of what you do in uh, big fish training. But for now, it's been an absolute joy having you on this show and thank you so much for joining me today thank you very much it's likewise it's been such a pleasure thank you i've i've learned a lot and it's it's been really pleasurable thank you you're welcome thank you and you have a great day now Mm -hmm.